Let's get into a few points here. And some things have happened over the weekend. I'll give you guys some insights and some things that even I was a part of that really kind of surprised me as well. But I want to go to first a few tweets here, and then we'll get into the Bitcoin price. We'll take a look at a chart toward the end of the, of the show today as well. Just in, BlackRock expects a spot Bitcoin ETF to be approved on Wednesday. This is coming over from Fox Business. And of course, I think a lot of people, if you look at just a little bit of the commentary from the tweets, everybody's pretty much in the same camp of where this plays out. I think the real question is, is what kind of impact this has. And we'll get into some things that maybe could lead us into whether or not this will have a long-term effect or more of a short-term effect. I'd love to get your comments also. So make sure and smash a like button right now. Just take a little bit of time, hit the like button, and let's get into it here from James Seyfert. Wow, this morning was wild for Bitcoin ETF filers. Here's the state of play. And it's basically a fee war right now. And the longest long-term fee is Bitwise. They're coming in at 0.24. Uh, Van X coming in at 2.5. Uh, we also have a fee waivers on three to six months uh, down to 0%, and then plus BlackRock's waiver uh, to 0 0.20. They have some other factors in it uh, to them. But this goes back to something that even James Safer and I had a conversation on back in December, and that is that there's massive a massive race toward not only the marketing component, and you probably have heard me say this, is that the fee architecture is going to be a really critical component for new people coming into crypto. And even the ones who are maybe in the middle of you and I and traditional finance, they'll probably go to places like uh, Coinbase. So how is Coinbase going to play into that? And we'll show you here in a second. Further into this, Eric Balchunas comes in and says, hey, good catch by Katie. BlackRock fee will actually be 0.2 for the first six. And then that's f up to 5 billion in 3, uh, 0.30 after. So even he was kind of looking at it saying, this is, this is pretty uh, aggressive. And I think the point is that when you have so many of these, uh, you know, traditional finance institutions really going after the market, it usually means one thing. And that is, there's a lot of demand. These people are talking to advisors a lot. And in fact, most of them, that's all their business is, is, you know, financial advisors around the world that are basically instructing and managing capital from you know, pretty much the rest of the market. And I think that's what is showcasing right now is they're starting to shop which one is going to be the best potential option. I actually ended up um, doing a meeting with four different financial advisors last Friday. And the big question wasn't a matter, we should get, we get into Bitcoin ETFs. It wasn't that, it was actually, what was the percentage of their assets under management that they would be making recommendations on. And this is a very interesting point. I'll talk about that before we leave uh, and in terms of how much. All right, so another tweet I wanna hit on right here. Grayscale just filed its completed S3, setting its fee at 1.5. Now that is uh, gonna be on the high end of it you know, when you look at the comparison against some of the others. Uh, and I think this will be a big problem for Grayscale for sure couple other tweets I want to hit on right here. This came from Ryan Selkis to that very point. The real question is not how much inflow would we expect around 5 to 10 billion in 24. Rather, the question is how much Bitcoin will rotate from GBC to lower fee options this year. So I'd love to know, what do you think? You know, Ryan's basically saying, hey, my bet is outflows from GBC match inflows to all new products. So that is a significant move in the right direction. I've got a few clips here I want to show you guys uh, to give you an insight to just how big this could be. This is a clip from uh, the Bloomberg analyst on just how the, F uh, the ETF will work. Listen in. So these things, it's just it's, the way that they operate is so much more efficient than the way that pretty much everything else operates. What happens is like with a mutual fund, it's usually the, the people running the company. It's a typical fund. Investors put money into it and it stays there. But like with an ETF, there's so many other things you can do with it. It brings in a whole bunch of different other pools of capital. You could have, you have people on Wall Street, you have hedge funds, you have traders, and then you have grandmas using this for retirement. So like it basically brings everyone together in one, in one specific technology, if you will, one wrapper. And that basically drives costs down because so many people are going to the same pool. And also you're getting the same fees, right? As a retail investor, for the most cases, 
in mutual funds or hedge funds, the more assets you can provide, the cheaper the fees are for using that fund or something like that. But with an ETF, everyone's in the same standing point. Like if you wanted to buy one share or 200 shares, you're paying the same fees, roughly speaking. It might be different costs in transacting there, but for the most part, you're you're as equivalent. You might as, Your grandmother's going to get the same experience for the most part as somebody at, at a hedge fund. So, and I think, you know, to uh, James's point is this really does open up the, the floodgates in the sense of just how much and how much interest is going to be coming in. Because again, fees are going to be the thing I think that drives a lot of this, at least in the first part of it. Once we get past that, I think then it's going to be the marketing that really starts to kind of shift this. Other things that a lot of people might be overlooking and they go further in the same interview to talk a little bit about that. There, there are some intriguing points that they do um, kind of highlight here. Listen in. Um, and that brings up two sort of overlooked advantages. One is convenience. And this is missed with the crypto crowd a lot. They're like, well, why wouldn't, why do I need the ETF? And I'm like, well, a lot of people just don't want to remember 12 words for the rest of their lives. Uh, <laughs> they like, they're happy to outsource this just like with GLD. So for the non-true believers, an ETF is a great solution. Um, because they can just buy it. It's going to look like a ticker in the rest of their portfolio, which brings me to my other underrated advantage, which is standardization. If you think of the ETF, like uh, like you know USB ports or gas pumps, you can go to a gas station anywhere in the country and it's going to fit in your pump, right? It's standardized. With ETFs, they take in all these different things like that are maybe trickier to buy. Treasury bonds, try buying those on your own. Um, I don't know, emerging market stocks, local shares, um, you know, gold. Uh, even the S&P 500 stocks, they're liquid, but it's kind of a pain to buy them all and then like, you know, rebalance them. ETFs take all those different things and make them trade like shares of Microsoft. So they're taxed the same. They look the same. They fit in your portfolio the same. So they've kind of equitized the entire apparatus. Yeah, this is going to be a big part of this is the convenience factor, the ability to kind of get that read constantly within all your different portfolio layouts. Because he is exactly right there. And I know you guys are watching this show. I completely get that you're easily uh, not swayed by an ETF. You're probably going to go in directly to a Coinbase or, or, or other places to be able to acquire your spot Bitcoin uh, on its own. And you're also probably going to self custody as well. So there's all of that plays into, you know, the traditional crypto friendly and crypto curious investor that's out there today. But remember, around 50 to 60 million in the United States right now. And if you think about that, about 20% of the U.S. investing in crypto, imagine if that goes to 50%, which is where stocks are. That is a massive inflow on how much money could be coming into crypto. Uh, this was a tweet just to kind of give another example on how this might work. It costs less to hold a Bitcoin ETF for a year than a single trade on Coinbase. This is a problem, I think, that would also play into it is how these other platforms like a Coinbase, Robinhood, et cetera, will play out. Because I think the competitive nature of owning Bitcoin, because remember, I think the reason you're on Coinbase is probably to get other assets and be able to explore much more in the crypto space. So most likely, if you are going to Coinbase, you've made it past that first entry of Bitcoin and maybe Ethereum at some point. And you're ready to make uh, the next step up. And probably in those kind of scenarios, your yields and also your winnings, you know, or investment pro uh, profits are going to be much greater. So it's a little bit different game, not as it's much more volatile. So it's not as secure. So that's another factor that plays into this uh, as well. If you look at the Coinbase exchange fee structure, you can kind of get a, a little bit. Of, remember what he was talking, what Eric was just talking about is the pricing tier because the pricing tier goes down as you invest more. And to his point is the fee is the fee when we're dealing with ETFs. That's an advantage, I think, to the market that most people going into Bitcoin today will most likely go to. And as I said earlier, when I was out with these uh, financial advisors on Friday, the question was, yeah, we, listen, we, we work with these ETFs all the time. We're recommending them in a variety of different industries. And we're willing to go the extra mile and do this on the Bitcoin ETF. The difference was, is the amount of assets under management that they were considering. Now, in the past, I've been told and have been looked at and researched somewhere around 1% is kind of the window that everybody's picking at. These four advisors told me they were going to be recommending anywhere between three and five, beginning uh, as soon as they could 
and depending on how aggressive their investor was. Three to 5% is a big difference from a 1% AUM coming into something like this. So they are talking about and or with a lot of people that are asking questions about this. Further in this, that kind of makes you think, all right, this, this is definitely in Gensler's finally caved. And that is the messaging coming out of the SEC. Here you got, of course, the uh, FOMO video that we saw on Friday. Uh, we did some fun tweets on that. But the point is, is that they're already starting to go in this direction right here. Further into tweets that they were hitting on. This was like a three-parter, you know, of how to invest some, you know, keep this in mind if you're considering investing in crypto assets. And this was his, his lay. Very simple, you know, rudimentary uh, recommendations and also using a lot of scare tactics in the industry to say, hey, look at what we've done. You know, we've kept you safe. Uh, and I think that is exactly the opposite of where this is going. Here's Warren Davidson kind of hitting on that. Definitely not protecting investors coming in from Davidson. His reckless leadership undermining the rule of law and eroding trust in America's capital market. This is the SEC Stabilization Act that, that uh, Davidson is trying to put out. Again, I think this is more for show. You know, it's a political play. It shows weakness in the Democratic Party, which Gensler, of course, is somewhat uh, abiding by. And I think this is, of course, just the GOP antics that we'll continue to see throughout all of this year, obviously, going in to the election. So I'll probably do some more on that. Here was Scaramucci talking about the Biden administration's anti-crypto. Uh, it's bad politics, and here's why. And I think when you look at these numbers, 20% of voters, 52 million, own crypto. That's more than a union card or went to an NFL game. That's not a big deal because the NFL games are so expensive. But 61% of them voted for Biden in 2020. And this is 60% under the age of 35. 40% of people of color, 75% less than 100K. This is where the market is. And I think that's the thing that a lot of lawmakers, legislators are missing is there is a tidal wave that's coming underneath, much like a tsunami that has occurred. And I think the ETF might be that disruption in the market that causes this to move forward. So it's definitely one to really be uh, paying close attention to when it comes to the political landscape. Now, further into this, the illusion of safety. This is the other scare tactic that I've seen being used. Uh, this came in, of course, why leading crypto wallets might fail to secure assets. And I think Many people are talking about the hacks, wallet problems, the issues with Ledger, what we've seen over the last two years with all these craziness uh, scenarios. And I, I really uh, put it this way when people ask me about self-custody, and, and it's very simple you know, when you think about it. This is your money. This is your investment, maybe your life savings. And I always tell people it wouldn't matter if it was a bank, which I would never recommend all in one place. I also in a bank would never recommend even having your securities and your passwords in one place. Uh, you should be treating it much like and really in the same vein that you do any other banking system out there. And I think that's where people lose it. It's just that you're using self-custody as the key. Now, to me, that's probably one of the most magical things about crypto. So if you are thinking about self-custody, make sure and check out Tangem. You can go over to their website. Just go to tangem.com. This is a really cool self-custody wallet because it's a card that has a tremendous technology behind it that works with near-field communication with the app. So the card needs to be present with your app, and then that signature has to occur for you to be able to do a transaction on it. Check it out. I get, if you are looking at self-custody, this is one of the best ones to take a look at. Just hit the Get Tangem. Get the three-card set. It's pretty simple. Use our 10% uh, off down in the links below. I want to go to a couple of clips here. And then we'll get to a couple of charts toward the end here. But let's play this next clip because this one is interesting because this is Jay Clayton, former head of the SEC. Listen in. I think approval is inevitable. And, 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 Imminently. Uh, and, I, and I think it, that there's nothing left to decide. I know. And, and I, look, I credit the SEC for where they are. What, what has, what, where are we? We're comfortable with the disclosure. Joe just went through the cost of investing in a big an ETF. People need to know what the cost of doing it is. They need to know, you know, about the underlying Bitcoin market. Is the Bitcoin underlying trading market something that is, what I would say, is robust enough, efficacious enough, mm -hmm. where you can rely on it? it? It is much better today than it was five years ago. 
Five years ago, there was wash sales, there was laddering, there was all sorts of things that you wouldn't want to make available to the general public um, because of that risk. And the last thing, and I think this is missed, is the technology to actually provide the product, the custodying, um, the create, the redeem. This is, a, this is a big step, not just for Bitcoin, but for finance generally. If you can digitize, tokenize underlying assets and trade that way, that's a potential significant change across finance, not just in the you know, crypto space. But you, you think Bitcoin ETF approval is coming and imminent? Yeah, well? I do. Yeah. And I could be wrong, but that's what I think. Okay. Now your opinion matters, former SEC chairman. <laughs> Yes, so uh, Jay Clayton, of course, um, the uh, outgoing chair over at the SEC. One point he did hit on, though, I thought was bigger than his assumption on what's going to happen with the ETF, is he realizes what this means to the financial markets. It's really a seismic shift in everything we're doing when it comes to tokenized assets and the transaction functionality, the speed of settlement, all the assets and capabilities of what blockchain delivers. That's what people are missing. It's still kind of masked in this overall view of, hey, it's a Bitcoin ETF. But in reality, it sets the waves in motion for a lot of other things to happen. We're already starting to see this, obviously, with what JP Morgan and Onyx are doing quite a bit already. So it's just a matter of time. All right, some other macro. Uh, one of the key macro events this year uh, to stop the Fed's quantitative tightening. Balance and reverse repos is lower to trill. Uh, this is since January 23. So it's set to change quite a bit, at which point the Fed could and would likely have already ceased uh, tightening, meaning no more raises. Obviously, we know that. So there's some interesting things happening right now when it comes to risk assets. And as we see the pivot occur, because I think we're now it's within the window, this is going to get intriguing. And I think this will be timing here is so eloquent, I think, in terms of everything that's happening. And when you think about timing, I want to go to Chamath. Uh, Chamath Paliapatia. This is an investor. He's been in the markets for quite some time. Whether you agree with him or disagree with him, I want to go to a clip because I think he hits on something kind of interesting. Listen in. What are you most anticipating, Chamath? I think this is the most important year for Bitcoin that has ever existed. Mm. We are probably days away from a series of ETFs being approved. And so this is the moment for Bitcoin to to use that old term, cross the chasm and really see mainstream adoption where our parents and our grandparents understand what it is, can buy it and then do buy it. And I think that if all of this comes to pass, Bitcoin will be a part of the traditional financial lexicon by the end of 2024. So that is my most anticipated trend of the year. All right. So what he hits on there well, not as much about Bitcoin, even though it, that's a big deal. Trust me, that's a huge step in the right direction. This is going to force the hand of every major market maker. It's going to force the hand of every bank regulator. It's going to force the hand of every financial regulator, as well as our own lawmakers that starts to move into a new era in finance. And that will be tokenized securities. And of course, all of the potential assets that underlie within that. That means the rest of the crypto market. Bitcoin is going to lead the way because let's be honest, this is the alpha dog in the race. The opportunity here for all of these risk assets are going to be the natural evolution of every investor out there, much like what you do in stocks today or possibly in small caps, all those kind of things. Strategy is going to start to play into it. I think crypto starts looking like almost like real estate plays of being able to look at this in long term finance being able to look at new acquisitions, new market penetrations, all these potential opportunities that really the difference is that I think makes the probably the biggest difference is that this is available for the average Joe. That's the real difference in crypto. All right. If you guys want to stay a uh, part of this, make sure and subscribe to the Diamond Circle. It's the best place to get in more alpha, more podcasts, more content. All you have to do is click the link down below, get in on that. And of course, catch me out there on X at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.